boys, taxes. <laughs> <laughs> we're back. Okay. So the, the reason why we're here today and thank you, uh, prime accounting and taxes for, for coming here and doing this with us. You guys are, uh, we'll say a, a partner of Montreal associates sure. in a sense where you were, you were highly referred by a friend of ours and, uh, you've helped, uh, people or contractors in our network actually make the transition from permanent to contract from sole prop to, to, uh, incorporated from T4 to incorporated, which they, they appreciate and we've gotten great reviews on. The the reason why we're, we're having this chat today is because there's a lot of questions that we get from contractors, uh, IT contractors, right? That's what we we focus on at, at Montreal Associates in my division. A lot of questions I can't answer, we can't answer because we're not accountants, right? And, and the purpose of this podcast is really just to start from scratch, baseline, if somebody wanted to be a contractor tomorrow, what do they got to know? And uh, just, you know, Give them, uh, give them the tip of the iceberg that they can then, you know, reach out to you and get get some more information, right? To to begin, I would like to start, like I said, from the foundation. What is the difference between a T four mm -hmm. temporary employee, uh, like a T four temporary contractor, a sole proprietor, or an incorporated contractor in Canada? So, in uh, any independent contractor, there are basically three that you just uh, explained. So a T4, a temporary contractor would be like, they would get a T4A slip, right? Mm -hmm. And essentially, you would be paying your EI, your CPP. Uh, you would be paying, uh, you're paying a, a, like a regular tax. Right. Now, the two that we really want to talk about, and especially a lot of the, uh, we see a lot of uh, IT professionals, especially the veterans, they fall under, is a sole proprietor and uh, independent contractor. So now when you are a sole proprietor, you are basically, you have your income and your taxes, you're filing it together at T125A, right? And uh, essentially you're taking on the full risk. Um, so before you set up, before you set yourself up, you should take a legal and financial advice in terms of what your scope or your future level of income would be like. What is your risk tolerance and what is the kind of business that you're doing? Uh, if you are going to incorporate yourself, the biggest benefit is you disassociate legal liability of that business to your personal uh, personal doing. So, so, uh, so if you're, you know, if you're in a business or you're in a line of work where that is somewhat necessary, it's important that you incorporate yourself. But it comes with a lot of responsibility as well, such as annual tax filing which you will be required to do as an as, as a corporation and a separate tax filing for personal taxes. So a lot of uh, individuals might be like, nah, I just want to keep it simple and I'm just going to be doing this, you know, a nine to five just under an, uh, under a sole preparator and that's that's fine with me. And you may think it's fine and, and, you, and it might be fine. So it all depends on what your scope is and how you're going to be functioning and what, uh, you know, things you're going to be doing. At the end of the day, there is a uh, liability to your personal doing on your business. You incorporate yourself. Your liabilities are detached uh, in terms of your personal belongings and your corporation. So that's the biggest benefit, but it comes with the added work that you're doing, annual filing um, and uh, separate tax filing and some other bylaws that you need to follow. So that goes into my next question a bit, but I want to kind of unpack this a little bit from yeah. the perspective of an IT contractor. And we say an IT contractor, this could be some kind of software architect, software engineer, yep. business analyst, right? Project manager. The the list is basically endless for working in technology. But when we look at what should be considered when just deciding what route is best, you've said a couple of things where we want to look at how simple do you want your taxes to be? Clearly, the most simple would be someone who's a T4 uh, mm -hmm. temporary, effectively a, a, a standard temporary employee mm -hmm. of a business, mm -hmm. right? And then we look at the, the most complex perhaps, which is the incorporated contractor route where you have a, an actual registered business and the middle is, is sole proprietor. I have that correct? That's correct. Okay. And then, and then you, you mentioned level of risk, right? W when you say level of risk, can we define that a little bit further with respect to, let's say, let's say a developer, right? Someone who's going to be programming, uh, through, an agency like Montreal Associates at a another client, say a big insurance company, right? What kind of risks should they be thinking about in perhaps a job like that? When you're co contrasting, say, sole, mm -hmm. sole proprietor or incorporated? 
Yeah, no, for sure. It's a, it's a good question. And there's, there's many examples that do come to mind where this does become relevant. Um, a lot of times in startups is a little bit more relevant where the actual startup themselves don't have really, you know, defined roles, defined scope of roles. A lot of their contracts with the end clients are, you know, not fully, all the I's aren't fully dotted, all the T's aren't fully crossed. So there's a little bit of ambiguity. And in that case, you know, it's always beneficial to our clients to be incorporated because if there is some sort of um, issue that can come up from lack of performance, if the contract isn't fully met to the terms of the end client, it's not really going to come back on them as an individual. Um, their corporation might have to, you know, be part of a settlement or, or some of that legal nonsense that can come about. But for the most part, you know, as an individual, they, they are um, shielded from that risk if they incorporate. So, you know, that that, that can come into play. Um, you know, I, I don't know if you can think of other examples where... Um, That's primarily, uh, especially the industry that we're talking about, it would be more focused towards it. A legal liability can come from various different actions, right? It's not just who you're working for, what you're doing, and, uh, you know, the consequences of that work, um, especially, you know, like it could be different dynamics. Um, like he talked about contracts between organizations, but at the same time, uh, you know, uh, your scope of work also can define uh, different level of risks that uh, that may be exposed. Okay, so w from what you're saying, then being being incorporated removes the person slightly from perhaps legal risks that if something on the job were to go wrong, uh, they they may not be personally liable, but their business could be liable. Absolutely. So it, it protects the the person. Now, again, you can probably uh, confirm this, but in an incorporation where there's only one person, which are I would say the vast majority of the contractors that we work with. Is that separation actually valid in the court of law, or because I've I've heard this this way too, where yeah, you know the you have a business and it separates you if if uh, I don't know there's a hack for example, and it could have perhaps been your fault personally, yeah. Yeah. but because you have a um, your business right, it's like oh it, it could protect you as an example, right? Um, not even talking about business insurance yet, yeah. because you're the only person who works for that corporation, would it not be a little bit more difficult for, to? Mm -hmm. because there's not like a lot of process in your business where something could have gone wrong sure. where you can claim negligence. Is that, is that valid what I'm saying? There are layers to that. Okay. Um, you know, I'll still say a corporation structure does shield you from some of that directly. Fair. Um, and you mentioned the business insurance. It, it is there for that purpose. So, so it is important to get that then. Business insurance is one of the first things we recommend. Even for uh, IT contractors don't have a lot of physical risk and some of that, you know, traditional risk that a normal corporation would have. But a lot of the times you're still entering into contracts. If you're a project manager, you still have, you might be outsourcing different roles. Anytime you're signing contracts, we do recommend get business insurance. It's fairly affordable, economical for our IT contractors. Okay. So it's not a burden and it does provide another layer of protection in case things do go awry. Um, you know, another thing too is you did, it's true that a lot of your clients would be kind of, you know, one person corporations. Right. Um, but a lot of times, you know, there are spouses, partners that are involved. Um, there could be some other family members that people kind of bring along for, for various reasons. Yeah, and yeah. and that kind of does that. spread out that risk a little bit too and provide another layer of uh, potential. Uh, yeah, like, for sure. Condition. And yeah, you would need a little bit of unpacking with the legal advice on that one too. But, sure. uh, you know, just what Nasser said. But in terms of other elements, I guess... Um, you know, there is that element where you don't, especially some IT contractors can be making a lot of money. Sure. And you don't, you, there are deferral strategies more obvious in the incorporated structure. Okay. Um, where you can choose to pay yourself a salary or a dividend. We'll, we'll and, get to that for yeah, sure. And, and yeah, we can break it down. And uh, essentially, you are able to defer a lot of your taxes if you don't need to utilize all of your income. Okay. So uh, from a tax perspective, is, is there a level of income required if you did want to say go the incorporated route as opposed to the other two? There's not a hard rule per se. Um, generally, when clients come to us and ask us that question, we kind of look at a holistic picture in terms of what is their family income? How many kids do they have? What does their spouse do? Um, you know, what other tax liabilities might be out there that might impact their overall tax bill? So we do have to look at it from a holistic perspective to give them that right answer. 
generally, the more you make, the more you can save from the corporation. So, you know, once you get past kind of that 80,000 mark, it generally does make it mathematical sense. It starts to make sense. It starts to make more mathematical sense to um, incorporate. And again, the, the cost to incorporation, the uh, annual filing isn't that burdensome for the kind of the simple IT contractors that kind of salary level should impact your decision. Um, in general, for the most part, it just it just does make sense to incorporate. Sure. And, and, and uh, the, the other thing I was going to ask too is with, ha- so what I take from that is let's say someone was a permanent employee mm-hmm. and they were thinking of going contract, they definitely could still sort out their incorporation situation beforehand and then get the contract later that they can run it through. As much as it probably will cost them a little bit of money, we can talk about that later. It's not gonna, they don't have to have a contract in hand to set up an incorporation, correct? Like they don't have to have a job in hand. No, no they don't. No. no. Yeah, so they can prepare yeah. everything so they're ready. And then when that right opportunity comes up, they can then decide to, to start working as a contractor through their incorporation. Absolutely. And in right. some level of uh, IT contracting, we've seen people hold more than one role. Uh, there are part-time roles. Uh, there are, uh, you know, elements of that. I was going to ask you about and that, that too. makes it more easier for you to, I guess, manage from an incorporated. Uh, uh, and it goes back to the answer Nasser just gave in terms of income threshold. If you are holding two two separate roles, you are likely going to be in that eighty or over thousand dollars per annum. And then it makes sense not to be withdrawing all that income if you're not utilizing it. No doubt. So deferral tax strategies definitely kick in much stronger at that level. For sure. And I mean, hey, like as an IT contractor, right? Not knocking anyone who's who's making 80K or below, but if you're working as a contractor, um, you're going to want to be per year, even on one contract, well above above, above this. And if you're not, you can talk to me. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but, uh, but that's a good question though, because I've also heard from other uh, people who are looking to be contractors, do I need to have multiple contracts mm-hmm. in order to be a contractor compliantly is that yeah. is that true or is that not true it it definitely does help uh we've seen the cra definitely do a crackdown lately on those individuals who only have one contract so the guys at the bank who do three years 40 hours a week and exactly. then they switch banks back and forth as a contractor they're cracking exactly. down on some of those guys here in toronto it's very common uh, as you're probably well aware to <laughs> have those bank contracts and we see that come across a lot or government or government right. and uh you know, it, it had been going on for a while. We have seen recently the CRA starting to send a lot more notices, a lot more um, pressure on them to really prove that, you know, this is actually an incorporation with the ability to handle, you know, other tasks than just the the one nine to five that they have. So there has been a greater spotlight placed by the CRA. So our advice for clients has been very clear is that definitely try to diversify. Mix it up. Um, if you got a life partner, I'll, I'll bring that point up again and just just try to get them going somehow as, as best you can. We, we 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 get pretty creative with some of those things as best we can within the, the limits of the CRA regulations. And um, yeah, no, definitely that's what it comes down to is, you know, um, this, the CRA kind of changes its spotlight every few years. You know, first it was the real estate crackdown. Right now it's kind of that uh, the IT contractors in a few years, hopefully the spotlight moves elsewhere, but uh, we're definitely seeing that right now with, uh, with the spotlight. Yeah. So it's not necess- like not a hard rule to have multiple contracts, but it definitely could avoid some hassle from the CRA if you do have some diversity in where your revenue comes from. The verbiage in the contract is being looked at a lot more by the CRA these days. Really? So that is something we would advise when you're getting that contract, get it reviewed by a lawyer or, or you know, we can help in that too. And... Hopefully your HR is flexible enough to change a few words around to really give it that flexibility that, you know, gives the appearance that, you know, this is a, uh, it's a, it's a legitimate contract between a corporation and and the bank or the government. So that's really where it comes in then, eh? Where there are certain contracts that even though it is a B2B Mm -hmm. uh, transaction, the contract very much appears like an employment contract. That's the problem. That's where right? we're seeing the issues. Exactly. So even if, for example, it shouldn't appear like it, it should not. Yeah, of course yeah, not. Yeah. Right. It really has to appear like a business to business contract. Right. Now, if we look at an example, like I like to use the banks and the the government contracts uh, in this case because that's where you you may see things like that. But someone who, for example, perhaps was working three years as a contractor in the same business with the right contract, where it really does make sense, where this business has a specific ability to deliver very niche, technological, whatever, right? That's something that even in the eyes of the CRA should fly. No? 
like that should be fine because it's it's <clears throat> a b2b contract yeah nothing in there ha has anything to do with employment or doesn't allude to a type of direct employment where right. if somebody were to read it it's like okay no this is this is clearly they're going to effectively a right. consulting a consulting company to deliver a piece of work even though it happens to be one guy exactly or am i wrong no no that on its own might not be enough. That's what we're seeing. Okay. Um, there are other factors that play here. You know, the CRA might ask, were you on site in that same office 40 hours a week, 50 ah, weeks of okay. the year, basically an employee of that company? Or, you know, did you have your own office where you worked out of? Understood. And, and, and those kinds of things. So it's, so, yeah. I completely understand. It's a bit of a, a story there. Yeah. I've done contract staffing in Germany, actually. Right. And that's, I think the UK has a similar law now. Mm -hmm. It's called like IR35. I'm even not sure if that's a, a thing anymore. Yeah. But we used to have to fill out a questionnaire that uh, would basically deem the person a true independent contractor or right. not. I haven't seen this in Canada where we have to provide that with Canadian businesses. I've seen a little bit in the States with certain companies, but it's, it's, you're right. It's if this person, for example, has all the exact same permissions as permanent employees doing a very similar type of work where people are doing that as, as a perm, yep. right? Yep. That's where it's like, okay, this is looking a little bit funny. And then yeah. that's where you can get in some trouble. Okay. Definitely. Very good. Now the, the difference between a federal Canadian incorporation and a provincial incorporation what is the difference? Is one better than the other? Do you need to use one or the other? What's the deal with this? Well, for federal and you, you can be uh, registered as federal or provincial. Okay. It completely depends on, you know, the work you're doing, the geography um, of where your business was going to function. And it also depends on, um, it may not, it, it depends on the IT worker, right? Are you, do you want to be available? Or do you, are you going to be, is your scope in, an, in a province or is your scope more of a national level? The, the main difference becomes, you know, from a registration perspective, it's not too different. Uh, there are a few additional, uh, you know, you're, you're governed by provincial laws where when you're registered federally, you're governed by CBC, uh, you know, like, like you have, uh, your, 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 uh, your jurisdiction is national, but at the same time, you know, there's a bit of a different sets of laws. Uh, so if you're going to be only operating in Ontario, there's very little reason for you to be federally incorporated, uh, keep simple for the business. If you have any level of scope, let's say you're doing cybersecurity for, I don't know, uh, TD Bank, um, they're across national. And if there is any reason for you to be ge uh, geographically available or, uh, you know, your company is going to get contracted in New Brunswick and, and Ontario at the same time, then, okay, maybe there's a different scope of work and there's a different need uh, here. But most IT contractor, I would think they're geographically localized. Um, so it would make sense. We I haven't really come into a situation where, we had to tell someone you need to be federally incorporated versus provincially incorporated. Just be, like I'm talking IT specific, uh, just because they don't have any functions outside of the province. So keep it simple. You function within that province, uh, the, the provincial laws, uh, and you don't need to be um, you know, exposed to federally governed laws. So if... And the only reason I ask is because there's a lot of contractors that want to take contracts where the head office of their client is outside of Ontario. We're in mm. Ontario now, by the way, for those of you who don't know, <laughs> Toronto. <laughs> uh, for, for, those, for those contractors who are trying to work with clients outside of Ontario or perhaps even the United States, does that automatically mean they should be having mm. a Canadian federal incorporation mm -hmm. as opposed to provincial or no? No, no for, for IT contractors, no. Uh, no. The majority of our clients are... Provincially registered. We have a lot of clients in Alberta, BC, and Ontario. Okay. Um, it, it's fine. It, and they it, can trade with clients anywhere in Canada still and the States. That's correct. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, cool. The, yeah. There, there's a few steps to that. We can we can dive into the States. The States is a little bit different than Canada. But yeah, for the most part, when it comes to, you know, providing any sort of IT service, um, it, it's fine. A lot of our clients are federally registered because they went through a lawyer. So the lawyers tend to do federal registrations, a lot of them. Do you know why? Do they make more money that way? I, I, yeah, I think I'm guessing it's probably a little it's bit. It's a little that. more complicated. That's right. why. And complicated for lawyers means <laughs> better money. <laughs> One okay. more billable hour, exactly. Right. One more billable hour. No doubt. Um, so uh, we get a lot of those. Um, but yeah, to Ali's point, there's for your 
your um, your listeners, there's really probably not much reason to ever really do a federal incorporation. If they have grand plans, grand visions, grow this thing out, definitely might be something uh, to look so at. So perhaps if they wanted to have employees eventually that are, are in different provinces and not their own, is that where maybe a federal could make sense or not even? You still don't need it. Uh, okay. Any corporation can have a payroll account set up with the CRA. So that is the main thing from a CRA perspective. Nice. Um, however, you know, em employees in different provinces might prefer that for some reason. But to be frank, no, there's, there's not much. Okay, so you can get yeah. by with a local provincial one. And, yeah. and regardless, whether it's provincial or federal, you did recommend that they should get business insurance as, as a corporation, 100%. right? That's a good idea. Now, I've heard... I've I've heard someone say this, and, and again, I didn't really have a, a rebuttal. Um, it's one of my contractors, maybe. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> I, I didn't really have a rebuttal for this because I didn't fully understand, but they were saying, oh, you know, when, when the agency asked me to provide business insurance, I never do that because that means liability gets pushed down to me. Uh, and, and I'm thinking it's because the agency, so Montreal Associates obviously has business insurance, mm -hmm. but does, if if the person who's ahead of you in the chain before the client, mm -hmm. if they have business insurance, does it automatically stop there? Or if you made the mess, can the buck still come down to you without insurance? Think of getting another podcast with a lawyer on. I was gonna say yeah, <laughs> we should have had one, but that's okay. No, if, if that's like if that's too much on the lawyer side, we can do that in another session. I'm just probably there might be one walking down Young right now. Yeah, you can probably, uh... run out. <laughs> All good. We can we can uh, we can good move question. on from that one. Yeah, yeah no, I'll. I'll, yeah. I'll yeah. Keep that one in the bank. Uh, what are the steps to setting up an incorporation? Can I do this myself? Do I need an accountant? You could use an accountant for professional advice uh, mm -hmm. and help you go through the process. But in terms of, uh, you know, setting it up is pretty simple, um, depending on the structure, right? But it can become, like, if you do it thoroughly, um, you know, you're choosing a name, you're registering it. If you're doing it, uh, you know, if you register... So just going, connecting back to the previous point, if you are registering as a provincial corporation, your name is not protected in other provinces. So, so that someone could, can take your name. Yeah, someone can take your name. You know, so if, uh, for example, I don't know, take you know, uh, Ali's Cafe. I open it up in Ontario. Tomorrow, I want to open it up in Manitoba, and somebody else could have already opened up an Ali Cafe. Gotcha. And I don't have the rights to it. So, 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 so a little bit of that can happen. So, so choosing the name, you know, in terms of uh, setting up a corporation, you choose your name, uh, establish your article of, uh, you know, articles, um, select and appoint your directors, um, and then you file those articles. Uh, once you file those articles, you set up bylaws, uh, you make sure you convene a meeting and, you know, uh, essentially follow the bylaws. That's, those are the simple steps in a very nutshell, and it's not that difficult. And in between, you you get your business number. It takes about a couple of that's couple the HST of, number. Yeah, right? well, or GA, it depends on your province. Yeah, depend, I guess. depending on where you're uh, where you're where you're tax operating. Tax number, we'll call it. Your tax number and your business number. They all, uh, you know, it takes about five to six days, and you know, you get it, and then uh, and then you convene your meeting. So setting up an incorporation, getting up getting the right tax advisors and your legal advisors is essential. And from there on, it's pretty simple. Steps are very simple. Um, uh, Canada and Ontario, they made it very simple to, uh, to, to create businesses, to operate businesses, but you just need to understand and get the right advisors and experts in the room to make sure you're doing it correctly and within the correct, uh, you know, with, with whatever your scope of work is, you're doing it within that domain. Understood. And there's like, there, there, I believe there would be a government, pro, there a provincial government website where you would go and do that or have an accountant do it for you. And there's a Canadian federal uh, website where right. you either do it yourself, like you actually click incorporate, right? Uh, or have an accountant help you with, walk you through the process. Okay. Essentially. Yeah, I think just to add on, I, I think where a CPA or, or a lawyer could help with this process is there is a lot of legal jargon through those forms. So that's, I think, where, I, where just a lot of uh, IT contractors come to us. It's, it's quicker, doesn't cost too much. And again, it's, we're able to do that holistic analysis for them just to help them set up the corporation with potentially family members, potentially other people to, to really help reduce that tax bill once they kind of start making that money. Yeah, I can't wait to get to that part. Mm -hmm. Should I, uh, let's say I do this. Open up incorporation, got a contract ready, I'm, I'm working. Right. I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm billing. My, my corporation is making revenue. Right. 
how should I pay myself? Should I payroll myself? Should I issue dividends? Is there another way to pay myself? Some kind of combination. Let's say this person is making well over 100,000 or their revenue is well over 100,000, 150,000 plus uh, per year. What's the best strategy? And there's probably no perfect one, but let's talk about it. There's no one size fits all, like you just said. Mm -hmm. um, you could pay yourself a combination, right? You can pay yourself only salary. You can only pay yourself dividend. You can pay yourself salary and dividend. Um, having a payroll uh, has its complexity, but it has a lot of benefits too. So a payroll, you know, you are liable for CPP, EI, uh, but you also get the benefit uh, through it, uh, you know, when the time comes. And, uh, you know, if Cause it's a deduction, the payroll, deduction. payroll cost, payroll tax, what's payroll, deductible? Setting up payroll, uh, no, like um, you're paying into CPP. Right. You're paying into EI, ah, okay, so right? If you need that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, if you gotcha. need that, you're contributing and you're actually, and you can uh, have your long-term yeah, your long -term strategy your makes sense. Oh, gotcha. Um, what the dividend allows you to do, you don't need to, uh, like you're not, a lot of time you're not withdrawing the whole, uh, the entire income and dividend can be, you know, when you look at different uh, tax brackets, dividend could be sometimes tax advantageous. Um, the reason, like I have one, one client outside of uh, the IT industry, mm -hmm. um, there's a grant available for that specific industry, but the grant was only available if someone actually was on a payroll. Right. But these two brothers, they have a nice business, uh, you know, uh, but they dividend were only paying only. themselves dividend. They can't access they the grant. They can't access the grant. And, uh, you know, it's a couple hundred thousand dollar grant accessible to that industry. All their friends and colleagues are doing it, but they, they can't, can't access it. it because they didn't realize how big they're going to become, they be, you know, they went from a hundred thousand to a $2 million revenue in like six years. And, and, and it was big in terms of what they did. Um, but now they're not, now we're resetting them up correctly. So they can they, be, they would have come to us. Wow. So, so now resetting them up correctly, making sure, making sure, you know, you're, you're getting the right industry expertise and advice. Because not one size fits all, and in the, in his case, there should have been some, uh, you know, there should have been a payroll and a dividend set up. What actually? Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to add for a lot of newcomers to Canada too. Um, a lot of times, the first question we get asked is, Canada does have relatively high taxes from a, you know compared to a lot of the countries a lot of newcomers come from. So the first question is, you know, how can I save taxes? But you know, the question we go back to them with is, okay, but what are your financial goals, right? Do you want to qualify for your first house? Do you want to get a car? If that's the case, then sometimes, you know, the payroll, having that regular T4, contributing, banks like that kind of stuff, right? So depending on their financial- Show consistency and in income, that's where payroll could be valuable, right? Exactly. Absolutely. If you got the house, you got the car, your life is set up, that's where you may want to lean more towards the dividends, I guess. Could be. Could be. Could exactly. Be. Exactly. Well, can we talk about the tax rates actually? So, sure. Because you, what happens, and what we're going to, I guess, talk about this in a minute, but obviously you have to pay- you have to pay or charge HST on your services, pay HST, you got to pay corporate tax and you eventually got to pay income tax yep. if you pay, if you payroll yourself. And then I'm sure there's some kind of dividend tax that you yep. lose, right? They're yep. going to get you. Uh, One way or another. Yep. Can, can you walk me through what those, those percentages are for each of those situations? Sure. So being here in Ontario, um, assuming the client is in Ontario, you know, when you invoice them, it's going to be that 13%. For IT contractors, there's not as many HST deductions available as there are for, you know, goods and services business where you have a lot more inventory and, and those things. So, um, you know, a lot of times every quarter our clients do have to pay most of that HST back that they've collected back to the government. Um, but, you know, that that's kind of an in and in out. So it's not really a, a real tax for most of our, our contractors. Um, the two main taxes that we should talk about are the corporate income tax, which is the profit that the corporation makes the roughly 12.5% uh, tax that the corporation has to incur. No matter how much revenue they make or up to a certain amount. That's it. it so for corporate taxes, it's, it's pretty much a flat rate for the most part. Um, so I, if I, my revenue is 2 million. So under, okay. Yeah. So, I mean, I'm talking more for it contractors, which you'd be surprised my friend. True. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> But let's say so. Yeah. I think he's, is it up he's to, trying to recruit us. Eh? Is it up to? Is it up to? It's five hundred grand. No. Um. So given that almost all of your clients would still qualify as a CCPC, um, a Canadian controlled private corporation, 
uh, assuming they're Canadian resident, which we can also discuss if, mm-hmm. if they are not. Um, that corporate tax rate would be around that uh, 12.5% for Ontario corporations. That rate doesn't differ too much by province. You know, the provincial portion is, isn't is too different. So even if you're in Quebec, Alberta, that corporate tax rate in Canada is pretty low and pretty consistent across provinces. Um, where it hurts most is on the personal side. And whether you get a dividend or a salary, um, you do have to pay personal taxes. And as you're probably aware, the more you make, the higher the rate goes. Um, probably for most of your clients, you know, they are getting to that 45 percent is yeah. um, tax bracket, which which does hurt. And that is where, you know, initially we mentioned, for the most part, dividends, the net math on that does help. Um, it's just a lower tax bracket. So if you're in a higher tax bracket, the income tax that you have to pay on a dividend wouldn't most likely be lower than what you have to pay on a straight salary. Okay, so on the if we look at the straight up payroll, if someone payrolls themselves, effectively they get taxed just like they do as a permanent employee because that's how they're running it. You're a permanent employee of your own incorporation. You are going to pay taxes yeah. like any permanent employee would up to, you say 40, it feels like 50, but you know, uh, they're going to they're gonna pay tax within the respective bandings. Yes. With dividends, can we just get a bit more detailed yeah. on, on what that tax actually looks like and, and perhaps percentages? Uh, for sure. So... For the T4, one thing to also keep in mind is the corporation, your corporation, has to pay the employer portion of CPP and EI. Right. Mm -hmm. So if you're an employee at a normal corporation, you're only incurring that one side of it. At a corporation, you got to pay both sides of it. So um, there is that additional hit that... um, Which is deductible, though, from payroll, right? What you pay. So that's the advantage, right? Is that the corporation gets a deduction? Right. Um, That's what I mean. Exactly. Now, the reason, again, most people do take the dividend, though, is because of what I was talking about before, where corporate tax rates are pretty low in Canada. Personal tax rates are much higher. Mm-hmm. So you you do whatever you can to save on that personal portion of taxes. Understood. Um, and, and that's where there is something in Canada called the, the div, um, eligible tax dividend credit. Mm-hmm. And that's what kind of gives you a, like a roughly a 15% break on the taxes that you that you pay if you get a dividend versus if you just got straight salary. Um, so by comparison, yeah. if we look at someone who, one business where they they pay the contractor, the business person basically pays themselves uh, X amount of dividends and then another business identical, the person pays themselves the exact same amount of money as yeah. a payroll, yeah. the taxes paid by the person, yeah. the employee of the corporation should be about... 15% lower on the dividend side. All else equal. Yes and no. <laughs> okay. Because you still have to take into consideration the fact that the corporation isn't saving taxes when they're paying out dividends. So a dividend is not a deduction to the corporation. Right. Yeah. So you don't get that portion of tax savings. Sure, sure. If we yeah. just talk straight personal. Straight personal. Straight, if we look at the, the amount of tax that someone would incur. Yeah basically taking complete payroll with the yeah. same amount of money as someone else doing the dividends. Is that a good way to look at it? If we forget about for the corporate yeah. for a minute. So you still can't give a, a definite answer because unfortunately in Canada, the math is never, it's never easy. Yeah, yeah. It, because They do that on purpose, I'm certain. They do. Um, helps us a little bit, but yeah. Um, you know, the because you have that laddering system of the rates right, and the fact that everything in Canada is based on family income, Depends how much your spouse is making. Depends if you got children or not and how old those children are. It's not a straight black or white answer. But for a vast majority of clients, when we do the math, we, and we do that for our clients. Right, so you them. can show them flat we, out. Exactly. Where it's like, we can look, do scenarios you, for them. Exactly. Right, if you pay yourself this much and then you give yourself this amount of dividends, this is kind of what you're going to net as a person. This is what it looks like for your business and vice versa, however you want to move the scale. Part uh, of, yeah. Part of it is also how they want to plan their long-term right. financials, Right. So I like I understand the question is how much as an employee would you be paying, but that employee also owns that corporation and what is his vision for that corporation? Right. right? So does he want to amass you know a certain amount of dollars for that corporation that can eventually lend another corporation to buy something else or invest into a different business? Those are things that open up to a lot of you know like uh, like. A lot of possibilities, right? A lot what of you possibilities. Can do with the business a lot of possibilities. Making money. Especially those contractors that are making half a million dollars or are getting up there. They, nobody's spending half a million dollars. Well, at least not 
you know, a lot of people I know. Um, but but you're trying to buy a house in Mississauga. Mm. Yeah. That's your down payment. <laughs> yeah, that 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 and that's, that's different, true. right? And that's and that's different. And <laughs> and uh, and uh, and just, you know, so what is holistically your savings? Yeah. So a bit of a hybrid model sometimes work for different individuals. Yeah. yeah. Um versus, you know, straight payroll or straight dividend. Uh, and you know what Nasser alluded earlier also the benefits of having a payroll, whether it's a grants or whether it's a, you know showing up at the bank and getting a loan, a lot of those things contemplate you know like like where are you in your financial journey is going to dictate how you want to be set up. Okay, and just to quickly add, let's say you get a two hundred thousand dollar eight month contract, and you know after that eight months you know you might go away for a couple months or you you don't see anything in the pipeline right now. Well, if we know that, then we can say okay, you know what. Let's not take too much of that profit right now in this year. Next year might be more dry. Let's, you know, defer some of that or a lot of it to, you know, the next year and, and save a lot of taxes. So you can have still a salary while you're technically not even working. If exactly. you wanted to do it Keep like withdrawing that. that money when you're not making money, you'll get to that lower tax brackets and, and that's where it can help as well. Yeah, the financial planning, I imagine, with, uh, with proper accountants is like invaluable for situations like this where sometimes that's how they want to structure it. They yeah. want to do three, six months on, couple months off, back sure. and forth. That's Very like the, yeah. the beauty about being a contractor yeah. who can work remote yeah. as an example. And, and on that, when we're talking about cross-border, if I am an IT contractor open my incorporation how can I work with US based clients yeah. as a Canadian incorporation or provincial incorporation for sure so it's becoming very common these days uh, those US contracts can be pretty juicy mm -hmm. and, and we're seeing a lot of that come through um, you know the, the, the quick answer is it's um, get those contracts sign them bill in USD and, and just kind of register yourself in the state that you're going to be billing in if you're going to meet that state's threshold of sales tax. Um, so, so to put that in simple words, if your client's in California and California says, you know, if you're going to be making over 200000 a year in our state, you got to pay us sales tax. So whatever the threshold is, just go and register there and, and, and you're set up, you're good to go. But yeah, for the most part, it's not too difficult. Uh, we're seeing a lot of that uh, invoicing to U.S. clients, and um, it's it's a booming business right now for Canadian contractors. So you're you're saying that if I'm registered in Canada already, mm -hmm. I want to consider also registering. I'm guessing some kind of S corp or LLC in the United States as well, or no? Stay stay with your incorporation in Canada and just invoice. How do, how do, what's the best situation? This is what I've seen, and perhaps yeah. these contractors are doing it wrong, right? But we can we can talk about this. That's the yeah, whole point of, of having having the chats. Yeah, probably, right? Who knows what kind of advice they're getting? So we get we get a contractor where obviously if if we're if we're the one who has the contract with the client, it's an American client, yeah. right? We can't we can't invoice that client um, Canadian tax because they're not yeah. paying Canadian yeah. tax, right? Yeah. It's a flat it's a flat rate. They're going to yeah. say we're going to pay you X amount an hour. Find us a contractor, yeah. right? When we go to the contractor, if we're directly working with them. Yeah. Right. The, if we're registered in Canada, from what I understand, right, we can, we can have them charge their HST on top of their, their standard rate. Yeah. Right. We pay that HST in as a Canadian business, we claim it back at the end of the year and the American company still pays the flat rate that they mentioned. Right. Because you're you're the middleman. Exactly. Right but if it was direct, oh, yeah. yeah. So yeah, it's it, direct is different. It's different if yeah. it's direct. So we have a bunch of clients that do it and they just, they don't put tax on it. Um, and, and it's been fine. Yeah. Because and they still don't pay that HST at the end of the but year they're on going their direct. USD. They, they don't have an agency like that. No, exactly. They're going right. direct. So if they're like, but, that, but that's also a good example because we have contractors who do both. They'll do it through an agency like us, yeah. right? Yeah. Where it's a little bit easier because technically their contract is with a Canadian company. The, yeah, exactly. Right? And then if you look at one that's working with an American, American directly, so Canadian yep. business to American company, yep. what a lot of them tell me they do is they have to factor what that HST is going to be on top of their base rate mm. because they're not charging, they're not charging HST, yeah. but they're expecting to have to pay it. Some of them though have told me the opposite where it's like, oh, but if it's an American client and I'm billing directly to an American client, I shouldn't have to pay HST. I'm not an accountant. I don't know what to say. <laughs> But yeah, yeah they, they got to do the taxes, right? I, I don't think they have to do HST either because a good or service is not being provided in, in Ontario or Canada. Quick question on that. If someone, let's say, for example, was registered in Canada with their yeah. Canadian business and was actually traveling yeah. for perhaps an extended period of time, let's say a month, yeah. to their client in, I don't know, Mexico yeah. or, or the United States, doesn't yeah. matter, right? They're traveling abroad um, to be there locally with the client every day. 
can they effectively write off that entire trip as an expense or are there things on that trip that they cannot? Like if, if they have to eat during the day and they're only there because mm -hmm. of business, mm -hmm. is that tax deductible for the, for the corporation? If they're there primar primarily for, for business. business. Yeah. That, that's, that's a full write off. That's a full, the entire thing. Yeah. The full expense. Like I don't, like there's no limitations. Do, do they need some kind of like corporate contract or like corporate policy that says per DM for traveling people, it's X, Y, Z? Yeah. As long as the contract doesn't specify that so-and-so contractor has to be on site. Um, because if, if it's saying that, then, you know, again, you're effectively getting to that point. Well, are yeah. they kind of an employee, basically a foreign employee of, of that corporation, right? So, uh, you know, as long as there's nothing there that pops up and we can, you can just... Yes, you can't be stipulated to go to the office, but it's like, I am going to service my clients service yeah. because I, I, for this month, I believe I need to be there. We're doing a go live or deployment, for example. Yeah. Right? Yeah, exactly. So yeah. that's yeah. something that- The projects, major milestones are coming up. I need to be there in person for X, Y, Z reason. Hence why to make that billings, I had to be in person. Um, so, you know, I'm charging it off. Okay. Yeah. Is it worth it to charge in USD if I still live in Canada? and all of my expenses are in Canadian dollars. We are seeing that a lot. I think the major reason is the, the US end clients prefer that. It, you know, a lot of times on their end, it's, it's a bit easier. Um, again, especially for startups in the US, they don't really have that back end really set up. So a lot of times it's just a pain in the butt to pay in Canadian dollars or foreign currency. So they prefer getting US invoices and, and, and getting that. The clients, absolutely. Yeah. For for individuals, it's, it's you know, it's it's very easy here. Our, our banking system is very uh very easy for US clients. We all, every single major bank provides US corporate accounts here. So it's it's a very easy process. You just go to your bank, request a US checking account, it takes them about two minutes to set up, and and that keeps it very easy. So yeah, there's w really would no you agree though that if um if I'm in Canada, right, and and I'm billing in USD, but all of my my life and expenses as of right now are are in Canadian, and I don't have much because of say my life goals. Sure. Right? I don't I don't have much uh, bandwidth to keep that USD in USD in my corporation. Sure. Would it be in my best interest to just get an equivalent Canadian contract in that case because I I'm always converting the money because I have to use it. Right. Is that would you agree with that or no? It's still better to take the USD, take the better currency. <laughs> diversify your income but uh if it's the only source of your income and you're expending the entire amount then maybe there is an anomaly here but you know you would assume as an incorporated contractor you may have multiple sources of income ideally ideally, ideally. and and then and then you might want to hedge uh, and you might want to get some advice from a financial sure. planner uh, you know, even from a foreign exchange perspective. Right. Okay. So th I think that that makes sense to summarize where if, if perhaps it was your first contract, this is what I'm, I'm more getting at. Yeah. And you're, you're making USD, like you're pretty much just going to be eating conversion costs. I agree. Unless, yeah. unless, for example, this first one's in USD. I got another one coming in Canadian where I could bank most of that USD and keep it in my corporation sure. without, say, converting it now. Yeah. And then using the Canadian dollars for like Precisely. the, the Okay. Yeah, I understand. Okay, so I've been giving good advice there. That's what I've been saying uh, to my contractors. Uh, what are some ways to legally reduce the amount of taxes you pay as a corporation and as an individual? Yeah, for sure. I'll, I'll start off and I'm sure there's a million things you can add in there. But um, when it comes to an incorporation, again, uh, I've touched on it a few times. But again, with IT contractors, we do advise, you know, if you can somehow use your life partner, or your spouse to kind of put them on payroll as an administrative assistant and maybe actually involve them in the business, you know, to help out with your administrative task, getting new clients, being your salesperson, a lot of that stuff saves a lot of money to the bottom line. And also, you know, kind of does a little bit of a legal income splitting there, right? If it's, if it's legitimate. The other thing, again, we advise our IT clients is if you're using your home office, get your floor plan, figure out what percentage of that house is being used as a home office. If it's a corporation, then, you know, we can write up contracts to say XYZ Corporation is renting out um, this space to be used as, as a place of business. If you're a, uh, a sole proprietor, then, you know, it, it's just a straight deduction as, you know, this percentage of my house and my expenses are being incurred to make that income. Um, and then, yeah, uh, as we touched on before, if you're going to client sites to hit project milestones, a lot of that stuff, then definitely, you know, a lot of that stuff can be uh, written off. So just... Keep those receipts. 
always use a separate bank card or credit card for all of this corporate stuff so that there's no confusion. The CRA likes it. It keeps it clean. It's the right way to do it. And you know, hopefully as you add a lot of that, those expenses up, there definitely can be some nice tax savings. Yeah. And I would, I would also think, uh, you know, figuring out, you know, what's relevant to your uh, incorporation in terms of sometimes there's industry conferences, uh, you know, are you, is that going to add value in terms of what you're delivering to your customer? And it could be in California, it could be in Florida, it could be in different places and where you could network and where you can um, have a clear justification for your business. And those are some of those things where, you know, you can, you can uh, you can establish that relation, and you leverage the legal allowable um, utilization of your uh, of your revenue um, in terms of how you're functioning. Uh, if you have multiple, um, let's say, even if your uh, spouse is a legitimate uh, person that's helping you in the business, and where you are able to establish income splitting, uh, you know, do we have you know? How, however you're incorporated, you know, you can have an annual general body meeting. You can do a lot of things where um, legally it's allowed and you have to make sure that there's a clear justification and relationship created for your business in order for that to be justified as an expense. And the last part, you know, what he just said, make sure you're using the right card, not your personal card and mixing personal and business, uh, keeping a separate line uh, definitely helps and avoids any, uh, you know, focus on your uh, transaction. So how, how far can this go? Because let's say, for example, I have a few thousand bucks yeah. worth of of technical equipment yeah. at my my place, which is very common for yeah. IT contractors, right? They got yep. expensive stuff. And I got a really big dog. And uh, this dog is a breed of dog that could be considered a guard dog. Mm. Could I perhaps write off all of the costs for this dog who effectively is my security mm. for, my, uh, for my laptop? Or not my laptop, yeah. but like all of my gear that's worth, say, five, six, seven, eight, nine grand. Has right, it, right. Has anyone ever asked you that question? Uh, actually, yeah. I'm, I'm seriously. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I, 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 what I'm yeah. trying to get at yeah, is yeah. like, could, could something like that actually make sense? Like security cameras, obviously easy. Yeah. Yeah. That's something where if, if you're, you're working from home, I would imagine, right. right. You could write off, say something sure. like this, but could you go as far as that? Right. So I think to answer your question, you know, it's, it's always a logical test, right? Does it logically make sense to an average human being for the most part where we get a lot of crazy questions, you know, in it networking is key. So if you go down to the club on a weekend, you get bottle service and everything, you know, where exactly is the line drawn on, you know, right. am I just getting clients or, uh, you know, right. am I just having fun? Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, so the narrative has to make sense. Establishing a clear <laughs> relationship, has... how you add value to your business. Gotcha. Understood. Yeah. Understood. Uh, that, There's a that... million CRA court cases on a lot of this too. So, yeah. I mean, when we get a lot of those questions, we do... It's, it's gone through the courts. You'd be surprised how much crazy stuff has gone through the courts. So a lot of this stuff could be answered. Gotcha. But I think that's a good rule of thumb, what you just mentioned, where like, does it does this legitimately add value yeah. to your business, right? If if really it does make sense where that's, you know, you live in a place where perhaps it's a bit dangerous, I don't know, yeah. and it does protect, then, uh, yeah. you know, then it is what it is. But it yeah, is. I, I, get, I get it how things can definitely be perhaps too far stretched, as, as you mentioned. Um, but that's where accounting, proper accounting advice can come in to see, okay, what, what actually does make sense for how you're operating, how you're set up. And, and I would uh, also advise any of your uh, IT contractors to be careful in terms of how and what they're um, retaining from, from accounting advice. There's a lot of accounting advice out on the streets. And you need to make sure that if proper is, you know, uh, is coming through sources, you know, which have the license and training, um, because we have attained a lot of clients where they've been audited and uh, their accountant has disappeared. Literally, that's how uh, one of our, you know, I, I would call it a pipeline of cons customers or clientels we have is because then that person also knows other people that were being serviced by the same accountant and they're running into the same issues. Mm. And uh, it's really important because, you know, people tell you all the great stories and the wins and how they saved all this. 
but very few will tell you too creative mm. accounting yeah, right where few will tell you yeah. uh, creative accounting only goes so far no 1 doubt. plus 1 still equals 2 yeah 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 that's really good advice cuz you're right there's a lot of stuff that goes around right that maybe they slid under the radar for a bit too long but yeah. at the end of the day when it, when when push comes to shove you can be in a lot of trouble right so exactly if i if i want to keep money in my corporation so let's say it contractor i got a few contracts i'm making money now right i i don't have to pay myself everything that I'm, I'm billing to cover my cost and, and live the, the lifestyle that, that myself and my family need to live. Uh, what are my options to invest? And can we talk a little bit about capital gains and perhaps the new law that was, I believe, passed? Uh, what can I do? How can I invest the money that's remaining in my corporation? I'll talk about the first part sure. in terms of how you organize your structure sure. of the corporation. You know, how is, how is your professional corp structured under a holding corp? Or uh, do you have different lines of businesses that, you know, one corporation has. Can we just define holding company really quick? So, so holding corp, uh, essentially, you know, how you set yourself up, you know, a professional corp can be under a holding corp and they can have different lines of businesses because each corporation should, you know, have a defined scope or, defi you, know, you know, defined business, uh, whether they're investing or whether, you know, um, uh, different lines of businesses that they're having within so they're, the same corporation. Within the same corporation, yeah. And even if you don't have it within the same corporation, you can still lend money and charge interest uh, as a deductible to one from one one corp to another corp. But within having, you know, we've seen structures we've created where you have a holding corp, you have a professional corp, and you have a bunch of other corporation depending on, um, you know, the 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 vision of that person or vision of that business and you are able to borrow money from one entity to another uh just like you would borrow from a bank and you know you're essentially deferring more taxes uh you're creating uh interest expense for one business um and and you are able to invest your existing dollars without actually withdrawing it and paying full taxes on it so there is that element uh, in terms of, uh, you know, the new scope and the changes that have come in, um, the announcement on capital gain taxes, you want to shed some light on that? Yeah, just with the uh, the rate increase on the capital tax gain, it, it will have an effect, especially on some of your clients who are sitting on some of those really uh, big gains, probably especially from property. Um, so definitely that that is something that now with the new rule, it's it's even more prudent that, you know, going forward, you potentially use a a holding corp structure, which is kind of like a, a paper umbrella corporation, where you know you can have your IT corporation, you can have a, a real estate investing arm or a, a stock investing arm, all in the same corp, all in the same all corp. under that holding corp, and uh, so so you would have the holding corp, which is um, it could be owned by like a, a family trust or, or you and your wife or you and your family could own that holding corp. So perhaps the holding corp may not be owned by you. Correct. Right. Okay. Yep. 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 Exactly. And then multiple corporations yeah, under that, exactly. that are owned by this holding company. Exactly. So the IT company would be the one bringing in a lot of money, um, right. pumping it into the holding corp. And the holding corp might then be investing that into the real estate corp that's sitting under it. A separate business. A separate business. Right. Um, so because the, the area of business the company is focused on, the taxes are different then if you if you have investments that are outside of your core business, is that correct? That is correct. Okay. Right. There's, so there's a concept of active and passive income. So if right. one of your corporations is a real estate flipping arm, then it, it gets a different tax treatment than if it was just holding one townhouse for like 10 years and, and not really doing something with it. So there are different rules depending on, on, on all that. Okay. No, this is very interesting because this is, I think, what a lot of people really want to get into when they start to do well, sure. right? People yeah. making 300, 400, 500 exactly. plus, yeah. right? So you, you're saying that... Let's say you open up a holding company yep. that is perhaps owned by a family trust. Yep. And that is to separate your different uh, lines of businesses. Separate your different lines of business. But, yep. but also the reason why you would put it under a trust perhaps instead of yourself is is for tax reasons and for if Lines. you're pursued at all for for legal stuff, right? Yep. Family trusts are used for uh, you know better taxation around inheritance and there can be a lot more structure placed into that. So, you know, if you want to get a little bit more creative, if if you have younger children and you want them to receive shares of the corporation when they're Without 18. being like taxed incredibly, exactly. that's, that's something that if you have a business now, yeah. you're starting to plan. Like when you, that's when you talk about planning for what your future goals are. So if you start looking at perhaps having that holding company 
that's owned by, say, a family trust. Exactly. Right? You can have one business that, and, and is there a way to, sorry, really quick, register a business under another business? Sorry, it's probably a dumb question. No, yeah, no, exactly. No, no, um, one holding corp can have multiple, multiple is, corporations. Is there a way to register it specifically, like on paper? Or like, how no, does that work? I mean, accountants do that part. It, it's, we do that part. Yeah. <laughs> it, that's probably yes. how, how things are charged, I guess, right? Like how... How businesses are set up. How they're set up. How they're set up. So I'll also expand on, uh, I'm, we're not going to take, uh, you know, just keeping it general. Sure. So for some of our, our high net worth clients, now we are uh, working with affiliates, uh, financial planners and legal sure. and, law- and, and lawyers. And, and essentially these are, you know, financial planners that only deal with high net worth individuals. You know, a million in stocks outside of, you know, be a multimillionaire outside of your house. Okay. Um, so that's, uh, you know, that this is where a good tech tax advice and where things are coming into play, where you've become bigger than what you, what you had envisioned or, Perhaps, where, yeah. or where you started. And now you do. employees at that point. Exactly. Now you need to hold, uh, you need to create a holding corp. You need to make sure your structures are created in a way that you're, you so defer- those are actual legal, sorry, legal structures, like contracts between the companies. Con- exactly. That's effectively what, what creates the, I probably sound like a moron, sorry, but nope. that's effectively what creates the connection between, say, the holding company and the separate corporations where you said, okay, this is the one where you're making all of your revenue as your IT contractor. Exactly. If you're thinking of investing some of that money, yeah. right, you can have another company that is going to be, okay, this is where you're going to buy your real estate. There you go. For example, yep. and you could rent that uh, those apartments. I guess yep. you yep. could yep. do that because this is a real estate business that is under the same holding company as your as your IT staffing or sorry IT uh, contracting company. If you wanted to invest in stocks, like you said, that could be a separate line of business with its own corporation under the same holding company. And this is effectively when you get to that level. If you are thinking of investing, probably the vision that you want to start to have conversations with your accountant, your wealth management associate, all that kind of thing. And we can bring them to the table. So Prime Tax has that ability now that we are, we have, uh, we've gone through a journey with uh, different clients uh, where we can bring a financial planner uh, at that level and a legal ad- and, and lawyers and legal advice under the same umbrella and try to have that conversation openly and candidly, getting the right tax advice, getting the right uh, planning from a financial perspective and a legal advice. Essentially, you need to think through uh from a legal liability perspective and what your what your goals are, even in, you know, like inheritance or how you're going to be passing down or what kind of insurance policies you hold, whole insurance, life insurance, and different products of, that may fall under, you know, different financial planning uh, products uh, and how that would impact your generational wealth. Right. And to keep that going. Awesome, yeah. guys. Yeah. Hey, this was incredibly insightful. I Like for me as well, who's not even an IT contractor, I feel like I learned a ton. I know uh, the people who are going to be watching this and say using this as a bit of a guide to get going when they're just, you know, like I said, just the tip of the iceberg to to start having those conversations to think about it, not just with with uh, with their family, but eventually, you know, uh, a couple guys like yourself who can who can help guide them on that path to get to a point where, like you said, you can start generating some of that some of that wealth for for future generations. So thank you so much, both of you guys, for joining me today. And uh, Prime Taxes, Prime Accounting and Taxes, if you don't know who they are, you do now. Look them up, get in touch, and uh, move from that permanent role to contract role. (laughs) Definitely. Save those taxes. Thanks for having us. Thanks for having us. Perfect.